One night, more than two centuries ago, while the rest of the Forbidden City slept, a plain bungalow was still ablaze with lights. It was south of the Palace of Heavenly Purity and north of the gate of thriving Imperial Clan. Inside, officials were writing swiftly at their desks, reading by lamplight, distributing memorials or pacing up and down. All were busy, but no one spoke above a murmur. Only when day dawned did the officials put down their brushes and proceed to the palace to see the emperor. They were his right-hand men. Their fellow officials looked up to them, and the public saw them as the elite of the Qing dynasty. Their place of work was far from grand, but it represented the core of the Qing dynasty's administration and the peak of the imperial system. It is known to history by a special name, the Jun Shi Chu, the Grand Council. As one of the ten unique traditional crafts of Suzhou, the tapestry technique of cursor is the king of silk weaving. The cursor expert, Wang Jialiang, cursor has not only sustained generations of his family, but is also part of his family history. The first three generations of the Wang family were craftsmen employed by the Qing imperial court to weave dragon robes for the emperors and sew mandarin squares or panels on the court apparel of officials. The members of the Grand Council originally had no formal rank. The Qing emperors chose them from among trusted Manchu and Han followers who were concurrently Grand Secretaries, Ministers or Magistrates. Their numbers ranged from as few as two or three to as many as nine. They were selected or dismissed by the emperor himself. Appointment by the emperor overrode any existing distinction of rank among the grand councillors. The grand councillor's seniority depended rather on his particular qualifications, his age and length of tenure, and especially on the degree of favor he enjoyed from the emperor. The council members bore a range of titles, from Grand Councillor itself to official or junior official with access to the Grand Council. The most senior among them was the Chief Grand Councillor, also known as the Kui Shou, or leader. From 1732, the head of the Grand Secretariat was also the Chief Grand Councillor. He had to read all documents and memorials before they were submitted to the emperor. Newcomers not only had no say, but had to precede the senior grand councillors into the palace and lift the door curtains, earning them the nickname of curtain-lifting grand councillors. As the Qing scholar official Wu Jianyu recorded, the appointment of grand councillors depended on the emperor's patronage rather than on merit. The location of the Grand Council reflected the Grand Councillor's close connection with the Emperor. The square, known as Tianjie or Celestial Street, formed the boundary between the inner and outer courts. To its south were the three halls of Supreme Harmony, Central Harmony and Preserving Harmony. The outer court, used for administrative and ceremonial purposes, housed the Grand Secretariat and the six ministries that ran the government. To the north of Tianjie was the inner court, containing the living quarters of the emperor, the empress and the concubines. The Grand Council was in the northwest corner of Tianjie. A short distance to its north 
was Yangshin Dian, the Hall of Mental Cultivation, where most Qing emperors lived and governed from the Yongzheng Emperor's reign onward. According to the Qing historian Zhao Yi, the Qianlong Emperor usually woke early in the morning between 5 and 7 a.m. He would start work straight after breakfast, and the first officials he received were the Grand Councillors. Yu The Grand Council was less than 50 meters from the Hall of Mental Cultivation. The location was selected for the convenience of the Emperor, who could summon the Grand Councillors for consultation at any time. According to the practice established by Zhang Tingyu, a Grand Councillor under the Yongzheng Emperor, memorials had to be processed on the same day, so the Grand Councillors sometimes had to meet the Emperor several times in one day. The Grand Councillors' positions gave them considerable power, but in the early days of the institution, their hands were tied. In 1726, in order to quell rebellions in the Northwest, the Yongzheng Emperor began secretly to plan a campaign against the Jungars of Oirat, Mongolia. The Yongzheng Emperor discussed the matter only with his most trusted confidants, such as his brother, Prince Yi, the Grand Secretary, Zhang Tingyu, and the Revenue Minister, Zhang Tingxi. The troops were mobilized and deployed to the Northwest in secret. The deployment was hidden from Qing officials and the public for some years. It was not until 1729, when civilians had to be mobilized for the offensive, that the operation was revealed. The Yongzheng Emperor then set up the military finance section within the Ministry of Revenue to deal with the campaign against the Jungars. This was the start of what would become the Grand Council. To better coordinate the campaigns in the Northwest, the Emperor relocated the military finance section and changed its name to the military strategy section. This was the next stage in the evolution of the Grand Council. 军机处啊，刚刚开始设立的时候呢，并没有衙门的印信，直到雍正十年的三月初三日，呃，根据皇帝的旨意啊，大学士们进行商议，才确定啊，正式颁发给军机处一颗大印。印文呢，就是办理军
。房间内部呢，没有被留下来的地方，就是日本人战爆发九一八事变那个时候被破坏掉。In September 1620, after two failed attempts to appoint a crown prince, Nohatsa, the founder of the later Jin dynasty, had selected eight princes from among his relatives. Each of them was to head a Manchu banner. He ordered them to meet every five days to discuss policy issues, formulate military strategies, reward or punish officials, and even, if necessary, to impeach the emperor. This group, known as the Deliberative Group of Eight Princes, strengthened later Jin to a point where it could challenge the Ming Dynasty. However, it would also cause no end of trouble for subsequent emperors. The first to encounter such trouble was Nuohatsu's son, Hung Taiji. He was named Khan in 1626, but the other princes, who were put in control of the Eight Banners, had almost as much power as he did. In order to consolidate his power, Hung Taiji placed the Eight Banners under the command of eight high officials, thus depriving the princes of direct influence over military, financial and judicial matters. Hung Taiji then ordered the Eight Banners to appoint three deliberative ministers each, to co-manage state affairs with the princes and commanders-in-chief. This new policy-making body was called the Deliberative Council of Princes and Ministers. In 1636, aiming to weaken the influence of the imperial clan still further, Hong Taiji followed the example of the Ming dynasty and set up three palace academies and six ministries. The academies were in charge of drafting decrees, while the ministries issued orders and handled day-to-day -day government affairs. But the later Jin dynasty remained predominantly Manchu. Officials versed in Confucianism were still excluded from meetings deliberating state affairs, nor could the reform prevent the princes and ministers from competing for power. In September 1643, Hong Taiji died without naming an heir. While all the princes in charge of the eight Manchu banners were eligible to succeed him, his powerful brother, Dorgon, installed Hong Taiji's six-year-old son, Fu Lin, on the throne as the Shunzhe Emperor. It was the first time in Qing history that a powerful prince or minister had served a child emperor. Dorgon and the deliberative council of princes and ministers which he controlled played an important part in conquering China's central plains for the Manchu Empire. Dorgon became the highest decision maker in the Qing court. In December 1647, at the request of Manchu and Han ministers, Dorgon was permitted not to kneel to the emperor. The following November, the child emperor granted Dorgon the title of Emperor's Father and Prince Regent. Dorgon is a Dorgon. 派兵去打那个农民起义，然后下江南去消灭那些难民政权。那个时候都是多尔衮在那指挥的，所以多尔衮
对于清朝的建立是有非常大的那个作用。On the 31st of December 1650, following a hunting accident in Luanping, modern-day Hebei province, Dogon died aged 38. His death allowed the 13-year-old Fu Lin to seize back the reins of power. He accused Dogon of several crimes, purged his henchmen, and replaced them with ministers Dogon had removed. The young emperor urgently needed to break free from the shackles of the political structure he had inherited, especially the policy-making role of the deliberative council of princes and ministers. But he had no mechanism to replace the well-established deliberative council system. So he turned to the tested model of the Ming dynasty system. In 1658, the Shunzhou Emperor ordered that the three palace academies should become a grand secretariat. He tried to transform the state founded on horseback into a stable civilian government. But only three years later, he passed away, and his reforms were curtailed when the seven-year-old Xuanyi came to the throne. In accordance with Shunzhou's will, four courtiers, Sonin, Erbilun, Su Kasaha, and Obei, who were not part of the imperial clan, were appointed as co-regents. Sunzhi皇帝突然去世,亲历的康熙是一个小皇帝, 他们会利用新皇帝继位这样的一个契机, the four regents immediately discontinued the Grand Secretariat and halted Emperor Shunzhou's pro Han reforms. Obei, originally the lowest ranked of the regents, gradually took over the powers that had belonged to the Deliberative Council and the Grand Secretariat. It was not until May 1669 that the reforms were resumed after the 15-year-old Kangxi Emperor had overcome Obei and his associates. In August the following year, the Kangxi Emperor ordered the reorganization of the three palace academies into a Grand Secretariat on the model of the Ming dynasties. This new Grand Secretariat became the center of the Qing administrative system. Before routine memorials were presented to the Emperor, the Grand Secretaries would read through them and provide comments and suggestions. This was called the Piao Ni system. Providing comments on memorials had been the most important function of the Ming Grand Secretariat and had placed considerable power in the hands of its members. However, heeding the lesson of the domineering Ming Grand Secretariat, the Kangxi Emperor limited the power of his own Grand Secretaries. This是原来的无缘阁的旧址 Under Emperor Kangxi's administrative structure, the Grand Secretariat held no material power, but was responsible for handling day-to-day -day affairs of state. Since it was Qing policy that the Manchu Eight Banners should hold a superior political status, the Deliberative Council retained its power to determine military matters. To further strengthen his own power, Emperor Kangxi 
sought to overhaul the political system inherited from the Ming dynasty. A bungalow south of the Palace of Heavenly Purity was even closer than the Grand Council to the center of power. In 1677, Emperor Kangxi selected a handful of young Han officials from the Han Lin Academy, or Academy of Letters, and established a new policy-making institution in the bungalow. It was known as the Southern Study. This was originally where the Kangxi Emperor did his reading. Officials were assigned to assist the Emperor when he wished to discuss history, literature and music, or the compilation and editing of books. Although the Emperor repeatedly warned the officials not to interfere in government affairs of the outer court, he nevertheless involved them in the drafting and copying of imperial edicts. On the northern side of the square was the Palace of Heavenly Purity, where the Emperor lived and attended to state affairs. Yuxie 那么钻立玉子呢, Those who enjoyed the patronage of the emperor held enormous power. This had been true throughout the thousands of years of China's imperial history. But for the emperor, the growth of the prince's and minister's power inevitably weakened his own power. Let one man govern the realm, let not the realm serve the one man. This couplet, a favorite of the Yongzheng emperor, reflects his eagerness to centralize power. The Yongzheng emperor acceded to the throne aged 45 in 1722. It was 78 years since the Qing conquest of the Central Plains. The Kangxi Emperor's record reign of 61 years had seen the Qing dynasty reach its prime. However, as a prince, the Yongzheng Emperor had over 20 years worth of experience of state affairs. He knew what he was facing. In his last years, the Kangxi Emperor had neglected government affairs. He had deposed two crown princes and the struggle over the succession had undermined political stability. The two successive instances of a powerful minister dominating a child emperor gave the Yongzheng emperor a lingering fear of the Grand Secretariat and the Deliberative Council. The campaign against the Jungars allowed him to assert his authority over the military by establishing the Grand Council. By creating the Grand Council and regaining control of the army, the Yongzheng Emperor succeeded in concentrating power in his own hands. Soldier,是在清朝的康熙年间才开始有最大的特点,就是快捷保密。而中间又经过写题要啊
counted as part of the imperial family's correspondence. Li Xu's memorials for the first 10 years were about local conditions, such as rainfall, harvest, and prices. There was nothing secret about them. Nonetheless, Emperor Kangxi annotated them in vermilion ink, urging Li Xu not to disclose any of their contents. In 1722, immediately after coming to the throne, the Yongzheng Emperor ordered that officials of or above the fifth rank should be able to send palace memorials directly to him. Any such official, even a provincial one or an abbot, could send him a palace memorial with imperial approval. The Grand Council is one of the few galleries in the Forbidden City that is open to the public. Its exhibits include a daintily crafted case commissioned by the Yongzheng Emperor to hold palace memorials. To ensure secrecy, only two keys could unlock the case. One was held by the official responsible for memorials and the other by the Emperor himself. The widespread use of memorial cases gave the emperor eyes and ears throughout the country. The officials of various ranks who could submit a confidential palace memorial saw it as a special privilege. Unless the emperor shared it, no one knew what information these palace memorials might contain. They gave the emperor access to all sorts of official and personal information regarding central government departments and local officials. So, in addition to governors having authority over provinces and the central government over local government and the inner court over the outer court, there was a relationship of mutual supervision and restraint. Such a monitoring system might not be feasible in a democratic society, but it was a relatively effective tool for improving governance and combating corruption in an absolute monarchy such as the Qing dynasty. But the system could be abused. Officials might inform on each other. A junior official could bypass his superior and report directly to the emperor. Of the preserved palace memorials, over 3,000 are from the Kangxi period, while more than 41,000 date back to the reign of the Yongzheng Emperor. For the more than 4,000 days that he was in power, the Yongzheng Emperor reviewed 10 memorials each day. He also made annotations ranging from a few words to over 10,000. In the 13 years of his reign, the Yongzheng Emperor wrote about 17 million words in annotations, a figure that dwarfs the output of even the most prolific contemporary authors. In addition to the palace memorials, more than 190,000 routine memorials were sent to the Yongzheng Emperor, an average of over 40 a day. Such a heavy workload meant that the Yongzheng Emperor was at his desk for almost all his waking hours. According to the official diary, the Yongzheng Emperor would begin work at 5 a.m. During the day, he met with his ministers to decide on state affairs, and at night he reviewed palace memorials. Often his day ended at midnight. Even when resting, he urged himself to be diligent and prudent, rather than seeking comfort and pleasure. To him, Personal rule meant dealing with myriad matters every day and working all year round, with no inspection tours or hunting trips.
the emperor's diligence set a precedent that was difficult to match. By 1748, 15 years after his death, there were no fewer than 13 grand councillors helping the Chen Long Emperor process memorials. Among the surviving memorials from the Chen Long era, the emperor's most common annotation had only three characters, Ji Dao Le, meaning notified. Ji 这个皇上容易这个这个意志容易容易贯彻，这么设的一个目的。Ji Ming Relay Station in Huailai County, Hebei Province, is the best preserved relay station in China. Military messages and official documents were carried by post horse. At relay stations, the couriers and officials could find fresh horses and accommodation. The delivery speed of official documents and military messages varied according to their urgency. Some messages called for the horse to cover 150 kilometers a day, while others required up to 300 kilometers a day. If necessary, the horse would be replaced, but the courier would ride on. Imperial decrees were sent to local officials via the various courier stations around the country. This might seem somewhat basic, but the network kept the emperor closely connected with his vast empire and allowed him to maintain effective control. Most of the decrees passing through the courier stations were dispatched by the court. These matters were handled swiftly and secretly by the Grand Councillors alone. In contrast, matters that the Emperor instructed the Grand Council to pass on to the Grand Secretariat were called Imperial Edicts. Either way, the Grand Council had become central to the Qing political system. The Grand Secretariat evolved into a department handling daily administrative matters, and the Deliberative Council of Princes and Ministers became redundant. In 1792, having concentrated power in his own hands, the Qian Lung Emperor abolished the official titles of the deliberative princes and ministers, and thus abolished the deliberative council system. The Grand Council was now an indispensable tool for the Emperor's governance of state affairs. The role of the Grand Council has changed from simply drafting imperial decrees to providing consultation and assisting in the selection of senior officials, making policy decisions along with the officials of relevant departments, and even hearing important cases. Not only were the Grand Councillors executive officials, they also participated in secret deliberations while concurrently holding posts in the various ministries. They were highly regarded but despite their status, they had no real power. After a rigorous selection process and years of hard work, those elites who finally managed to reach the political center of the Qing dynasty could only assist the emperor as he governed the country. The Prince Gong Mansion is one of the best preserved imperial mansions in Beijing. Its large-scale, exquisite style and fine construction far surpass those of the Imperial Garden in the Forbidden City. It attracts visitors from all over the world. However, the tourists are often more interested in He Shen, its first owner, who was a prominent official accused of corruption. In 1775, He Shen caught the attention of the Qianlong Emperor at an inspection of Imperial Guards. 
In less than a year, the 27-year-old bodyguard was promoted to Vice Minister of Revenue, Grand Councillor, Vice Commander of the Bordered Yellow Banner, and Minister of the Imperial Household Department. Although the Emperor had made it clear that Grand Councillors could not read memorials or take part in state affairs, except with his special permission, those who enjoyed his patronage could amass power. Chenlong 很信任他，也有些离不开他，所以也屁股了。In 1795, the Chenlong Emperor, who had reigned for 60 years, abdicated in favor of his son, Yongyan. He gave himself the title of Emperor Emeritus, and continued to rule behind the scenes. He Shen's power was at its peak. While serving as Chief Grand Secretary and Chief Grand Counselor. He held concurrent posts as head of the departments of personnel, revenue, and justice, and the court of territorial affairs. His influence over the imperial court was second only to the emperor's. Taking advantage of the retired emperor's favor, He Shen in effect ruled the imperial court instead of the new emperor Jia Qing. When receiving him in private, the emperor excused He Shen from kneeling before him. Some secretly referred to Hershen as a quasi-emperor. In early February 1799, Emperor Emeritus Chen Lung died. Ten days later, Emperor Jia Qing issued an edict finding Hershen guilty of 20 crimes and ordering the confiscation of his property. On the 18th, the emperor ordered Hershen to commit suicide. To prevent the Grand Councillors from taking complete control of the court, the Jia Qing Emperor took steps to reform the Grand Council. He forbade inner and outer court officials from informing Grand Councillors of the contents of their memorials or currying favor with them. Princes could not sit on the Grand Council, and Grand Councillors could not also serve as Grand Ministers. To prevent leaks from the Grand Council, the Emperor had the censorate place an investigating censor in the duty room of the Imperial Household Department. These rules and regulations transformed the Grand Council. In the collected statutes and regulations of Emperor Jia Qing, compiled in 1818, an entry for Grand Council finally appeared, signaling its recognition as a central policy-making body. Later, Emperor Dao Guang issued the Nine Statutes on the Grand Council, introducing further regulations and limiting the Grand Councillor's authority. The Grand Councillors now had significantly less power than they'd had in the Council's early days, or even during the reigns of Emperors Yongzheng and Chen Lung. With a highly centralized government structure, and the Emperor having an absolute say over state affairs. Imperial power was at its peak. In the Qing power structure, no official could threaten the supremacy of the Emperor. Absolute power made the rulers complacent and reluctant to adapt. Yet beyond their domain, the world was changing. In the 60 years of the Jia Qing, Dao Guang, and Cheng Feng eras, the Industrial Revolution saw Great Britain build a huge empire 
occupying a quarter of the world's total land area. Through wars, purchases, and annexations, the newly established United States expanded its territory from the Atlantic to the shores of the Pacific. The European powers that had carved up the rest of the world turned their gaze to the last vast nation in the East. The Qing rulers were about to face unprecedented challenges, but they had lost the vision and courage of their ancestors. Instead of reforming China to rise to meet new challenges, they stuck to ancestral tradition. Facing a conflict between East and West, they were forced to introduce so-called new policies to protect their interests. But the new policies did not significantly alter feudal rule. This conservative mindset led inevitably to the demise of the Grand Council. In May 1911, a cabinet headed by Prince Qing replaced the Grand Council. After 180 years, the proud institution officially disappeared from the stage of history.